Welcome to today's educational seminar on community lawyering. Um, so we have gathered three attorneys to talk about community-based approaches to legal services. We have Patrick Keenan Devlin, who's the executive director of the Moran Center for Youth Advocacy. Lam Win Ho, who's the executive director and founder of Beyond Legal Aid. And Tanya Woods, who's the executive director of Westside Justice Center. And so um, to start, if I could have three, all, all three of you um, introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your organization um, and kind of the, the work that your organization does. So um, Tanya, let's start with you, if that's all right. Sure, no problem. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tanya Woods, and I am an attorney at law here in the state of Illinois, a proud graduate of Loyola School of Law, for which I am super excited. I was not a Pilly Fellow, so um, I have a, a roundabout way of coming to this, but feel honored that um, I was invited to be a part of this panel. As the executive director of the Westside Justice Center, I lead a team of professionals in uh, providing legal services to uh, most underserved and marginalized communities, uh, primarily on the west side, but all of Chicagoland, all of Cook County and Collar Counties as well. And so we do that by providing legal services, uh, legal um, education and information, as well as advocacy work. Um, and I can say that, however, as much as my work is rewarding, my proudest role to date is that of mom of two, uh, I have a 29-year-old active organizer um, who's an environmentalist and a 22-year-old recent graduate of film and activist as well. Great. Lam, do you want to take it next? So, hi, I'm, I'm Lam. I'm, uh, I go by he, him, his pronouns. Um, and uh, as Brett mentioned, I'm the executive director and founder of Beyond Legal Aid. Um, so, I founded Beyond Legal Aid really as a... Uh, a sort of uh, an interrogation into how legal aid actually operates. Uh, so i had been working for about seven years in legal aid, and I really wanted to question why uh, lawyers get to make decisions. Why do they get to decide who gets access, where legal lawyers are located uh, for the communities that they're working, uh, how and where and how and when is it provided? Why do we have attorneys downtown who work from nine to five when a lot of the uh, people that we work with are also working nine to five to put meals on the table or to keep their uh, uh, roofs over their uh, families' heads? Um, and, and then the second part uh, of the sort of uh, questions that we were asking when we founded the organization is why is it that legal aid is often really disconnected with what communities are already doing to, that actually uh, very often is better and more effective than running into the courtrooms. Um, so Beyond Legal Aid emerged as a result of those questions. Um, and so our work is really to answer those questions in our own work and also now to really help and collaborate with other legal aid organizations to ask those questions and, and resolve some of those issues with their work. Um, so the way we do it is that we uh, basically, instead of having a legal office or running legal programs as attorneys, we actually work with communities to create their own legal programs, programs that are community located so that they're in community spaces uh, that are operated by the community. So they, they uh, are the ones who uh, will own and invest into the legal programs. Um, and then, but the most important part is that they are also community directed. So all the decisions regarding what cases we take, um, what uh, community members are eligible for services, what are the priorities, all of those are actually made by uh, our community partners because ultimately it's their program. So at this point, we have 23 um, what we call community activism uh, law programs, each of which are uh, operated independently. They have their own set of priorities. Um, some of them have their own names. So we have a uh, legal clinic, which is open five days a week uh, with the Vietnamese Association of Illinois, which they call the Community Empowerment Legal Clinic. 
And there they do a really holistic approach where everything from family to housing, uh, to family to housing, to uh, criminal records, employment, uh, we handle, um, and to programs like the Jane Addams Senior Caucus, where we only work on housing issues uh, for seniors. So all, all the programs are uh, completely different, which as you can imagine, can be quite a bit of a challenge sometimes for us as attorneys to be able to adequately staff um, and competently provide legal services, but at the same time really meet the priorities and, and needs that our community partners have determined this is what we want our program to be like. Um, and so that's the sort of approach that we take. And um, one final thing I'll add um, in terms of the work that we do is the reason we do this is because we see uh, a gap between legal aid and social justice. And especially in this moment right now, I think we're seeing it so much more. It's actually at the very grassroots level where we're seeing activism that really is gonna change things systemically. And it's not going to be in the courtrooms that we're gonna see genuine uh, movement work that will overhaul systems. Um, and we're gonna see reform in courtrooms, but we're not gonna see th the systemic change. And um, th as a result, we do this, we use our model because we really wanna leverage what communities are doing um, and adding legal work as just one tool for this bigger project that they're engaged in. So a lot of our work, you know, we do direct legal services, but a lot of our work is actually um, supporting uh, activism campaigns, organizing campaigns. So things like the eviction moratorium, um, uh, we're working with several of our housing partners to pass, uh, to extend the eviction moratorium, to work on rent strikes. Um, so that, that work is often some of the most challenging because lawyers are trained to go into courtroom and do, and do cases, but now we're learning that there are a lot of other ways that we can solve problems. And that's what we need lawyers to be involved in as well as working on cases. Great. Patrick? So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Patrick Keenan Devlin. I use the pronouns he, him, his. And as Brent mentioned, I am the executive director of the James B. Moran Center for Youth Advocacy. And I just want to start off by saying I am really geeked out that I am on a panel with Tanya and Lam because these two are just epitomize what community lawyering is and what systemic change looks like. Um, I run a small legal aid organization based in the city of Evanston. We exclusively uh, serve Evanston residents, so we are a community-based organization. Um, we are in our community, we all live in our, in our city, um, and we try to be as responsive as we can be with the resources that we have. Uh, our organization was founded um, in 1976 as a response to a crisis in our community where a young man committed suicide in a police jail. And he was denied access to legal counsel. He was denied access to medical care. Um, and we founded this community-based legal defense organization to rush to kids' uh, jail sides, but then to also provide them comprehensive uh, public defense services in the courtroom. And we pair that, we've always paired it with social work services. So we're an integrated legal and mental health organization. Um, but since our founding, we have, as I said, as a small community-based organization, we, we've been adept in trying to respond to community need. Uh, so when so many of our clients would be returning to our community uh, shackled with the burden of a record, we started an expungement and sealing help desk at the Skokie Courthouse. We serve about 850 people per year there and growing, uh, trying to, uh, again, quickly remediate the burden of, of that record to get them housed, uh, mortgages, loans, education, you name it, uh, that records hold people back from accessing. Uh, we then are, I, I love when Lamb speaks about legal aid, um, kind of rewiring ourselves and, and thinking, well, how can we be um, tools for systemic change? Uh, 
Uh, and, and I hope we are doing that at Marine Center in that we're using lawyering as a prevention tool uh, to, to keep families, children, young adults, emerging adults out of these broken pipelines. We often refer to the school to prison pipeline. I've heard often the foster care to prison pipeline. There are so many pipelines in this country. I call it the poverty to institutionalization pipeline because it's the broadest word I can think of. Um, and in that space, we, we represent children in getting the services they need in schools. Uh, our youngest clients are three. Our oldest clients are 21. To try to get them, again, the additional supports and services they need to be successful in school. We represent kids in suspension and expulsion proceedings. Um, and then most recently, we launched a school-based civil legal clinic, which is funny in that the school districts that we sue, we actually go into those schools and position ourselves in the school cafeterias and the principal suites and trying to think where else we're in the auditoriums um, to be as proximate to community as possible. And we address the general civil legal bread and butter issues that our community needs. And uh, to Lam's point, we, we've surveyed our community, we've talked to community members, we've done door knocking to try to figure out when we have those clinics, what times work, what times don't work. Um, to try to be as responsive as possible. And we keep rejiggering to be um, as, again, as proximate as we can be for, our, for the community that we serve. And then the last piece, which is in my mind, the real systemic work that the Moran Center engages in is we are a restorative based agency. So we have a restorative justice coordinator on our staff full time who works not only to build up restorative values within our organization, but within organizations that we partner with. Uh, because I hate referring out folks to other social service providers and not knowing whether they're going to get the same responsive, warm care that I know they're going to get at the Moran Center. So we uh, give a, we uh, partner for free with those agencies, with our partnering agencies, training them restorative practices, what that looks like, how that looks like in, in conflict uh, and mediation moments. Um, so we do that work, but then we really do believe that restorative justice is the way of the future and that we can uh, build a better community right here locally. Uh, and hopefully we can, that could serve as a model regionally, maybe even statewide someday uh, for building a more peaceful. Are you coming? So that's me. Great. Um, thank you all for being here and having this conversation. So now that you kind of set out what your organization does, um, and a little bit about each of you. Let's take a step back a little bit. And I know you've touched on this kind of just in introducing what your organization is, but um, what are your thoughts on um, what is the definition of community lawyering for you? Or what do you all see as the concept of community lawyering? Um, and maybe some of the unique ways that that concept um, is provides legal services to people in need. Um, Tanya, do you want to start yeah, us off again? I'll jump in on that. And I, I want to give a little context about how I've come to this field, because I might be younger lawyer than Patrick and Lam, I'm not sure. But I went back to school um, as a second career, maybe third or fourth, I'm not sure, um, and graduated from Loyola in 2013. Uh, so I've been practicing law not even a decade yet. And at the time when I was in school, um, Loyola was a place like DePaul and the other similar schools. If you wanted to do something public interest related or community related, that's where you would go. Um, and if you wanted to you know, be in a big law firm somewhere or make a lot of money, as if this were a binary equation, then you'd probably go to University of Chicago, Northwestern Law or similar. And I actually have an undergrad degree from Northwestern. So. I think that our profession kind of sets up these false binaries of you have to do this or that. So as it pertains to community lawyering, um, oftentimes the discussion was like, if you want to serve the community, then go stand in that line over there or go join that group over there. If you want to do anything else, and I do mean anything else, then go be with the bigger group, um, read more respected, more um, better paid, uh, and all these other things that go along with it. As a person who is over 50, I came up at a time where community lawyering meant that you were probably not going to be well paid. 
um, your, what you looked like and how you presented yourself was something akin to, um, you know, like worn over shoes and, you know, old clothes that somebody gave you and not a really good picture of what that looked like. Or if you were not um, a person of color, read not black, um, and you were white, then you probably were a trust fund right? Or you had money or your spouse had a job. And so you could actually afford and had the white privilege of being able to be a community lawyer. So these were a lot of the paradigms that I think um, existed and still exist to some extent in our field. And so uh, for young um, would-be attorneys who are thinking about what this all looks like, I think there are a lot of false binaries. I think there are a lot of false paradigms as to what community lawyering really looks like. Um, and I think that's why panels like this are so very important so you can see different models and see what's actually possible. So I came up in a time when things like Perry Mason uh, were on television. Um, as I got older, the paradigm looked something like LA Law, which I often say these were morally bankrupt attorneys who were all sleeping with each other, making wads of money, but doing nothing for communities. So the reason why I came to this late is because of these false paradigms, right? Like I came from the west side of Chicago in a very poor, impoverished neighborhood at a time when if your family could afford to get you out of your local public school, which was crap, then they sent you to a parochial school, which there was a Catholic high school or grammar school in every corner in Chicago and certainly in poor communities. It was part of like kind of their mission. And so I went to one of those schools. So the idea of social justice and, and, and these concepts came early to me, but they were always embedded with these very problematic kind of um, structures, if you will. And so community lawyering just didn't look very attractive to a poor black kid coming from the city of Chicago as something I wanted to aspire to. And so even though I might have had a desire to want to pursue this as a profession, uh, just even being an attorney, I just, it, just didn't seem like a fit. And I come from a generation, as many people do, who are from Black communities or communities of color, immigrant communities, where you're not just bringing yourself up, you are bringing your whole family and your community up with you. So if you go to college or if you go to law school, you're not just doing this for your immediate, you know, nuclear family. There are other people that are banking on your success, right? So, you know, this again kind of reinforces like this is not going to be the feel for you. But fast forward all these decades later, um, as I learned through my work experience, I would kind of peer over from my um, corporate world and go, huh, look, look what they're doing over there. That doesn't look what I thought it was supposed to look like. And then I had the benefit of actually coming of age in college during the Hill Washington administration. And at that time, um, my mom actually was an administrator for one of the deputy mayors. And what does that mean? It gave me a glimpse inside, kind of under the covers and behind the screen of what all of this looked like because there were a ton of lawyers doing a lot of work, working on what mom described earlier. And that was providing access. It was advocacy married with lawyering. And to me, that's what community lawyering can look like, right? It is taking your legal skills and applying it in such a way that might not be something that you immediately think of. And so that's working on cases that not only impact an individual, but can impact a family and then a community. And more importantly, for folks like us, um, have the ability to impact systems. And if we really push the envelope in the way that we want, it's not just impacting systems or reforming systems, but it's interrupting, disrupting, and dismantling systems that do not serve our communities well. And so part of um, a, a network that Lam and Patrick and I belong to is a network of community-based organizations across the state of Illinois that do this work in that way. So that means that we're not only taking our legal skills and applying them to a single case, but we always have an eye towards how does this impact the community and how can we then begin to impact systems that have been historically oppressive to the types of clients that we serve. And so that, I think, becomes the difference. And I think what often is forgotten is that when we take this oath, it is an oath to be an advocate first, whether you are a tax accountant uh, or if you do, you know, securities law or whatever type of law that you may practice. 
your first obligation is to be an advocate. And we mustn't forget that. Um, and so even when I have uh, lawyers working on probate cases, um, we are still advocating. We are still advocating in a way um, that I think most oftentimes is forgotten. So that's for me uh, what that really means. Thank you. Um, Patrick? I'll jump in, sure. Um, I, when, when I think about community lawyering, I, I am kind of a negative Nancy in that I think about what I do wrong and what I don't do well and what I want to do better. Um, and that's how I get to my definition. It's kind of a <laughs> negative way to approach it, but that's just where my mind took me. Um, I, you know, Lamb is just, again, such a, a, a visionary in, this, in, in, in our field, in the legal aid field. And, and I, and I want to be him when I grow up because what, what Beyond Legal Aid does is, is exactly what I would want the Moran Center to, to be, but we're not. And so I don't want to lie. Um, I, I want to see our clients um, in the structural decision making of our organization, uh, making the agenda, uh, directing the agenda. Uh, and, and right now, that's not how the Moran Center operates, but I really do believe that is what community lawyering is and what it should be. And I have plans for how we're going to get there, but we ain't there yet. Um, I, I think about one issue that's really top of mind right now, um, we have school resource officers in our schools in the city of Evanston, and we've opposed it for years uh, and have gotten nowhere. Um, but then with the rise of um, the movement following George Floyd's death, his slaughter, um, so many young people that we had not invited into uh, the advocacy arena, um, you know, pushed their way in. I mean, shoved their way in and screamed and hollered and got it on both school board's agendas. Um, and then it was actually them that brought us in and said, okay, we're, we're going to be the ones screaming. We're going to be the ones protesting, but you're lawyers. So help us think through um, what this could look like or, or, or help us with messaging or, or help us understand how this has impacted your clients historically um, in expulsion proceedings. Like who's getting expelled? Who's getting suspended? Who's getting um, thrown to the ground by these police officers? And I am really encouraged. I think we're going to make headway. I think we're going to remove school resource officers from our schools in Evanston. And it had nothing to do with lawyers. It had nothing to do with us. We were, we were just in the background. As, as we should be. Um, and, I, and I really hope that this model will continue um, going forward. So, so that's my definition of, of community lawyering. And, in, in, and that's a public policy question, but to Tanya's point, you know, take out public policy questions, stick in case. It should be the same damn thing, right? So that's, that's what I would say my definition of community lawyering is. Lam, I think you really incorporated kind of the definition in, in when you were describing your organization also, but um, anything else that it hasn't really been discussed that you want to point out? Yeah, so actually I want to first address, uh, I think Pat Patrick is giving me way too much credit, um, and I actually want to share a story um, which I think will really highlight um, our specific model or version of community learning. And I think maybe to start, I just want to contextualize. I think I do agree with what Tanya and Patrick have said around community learning actually having getting a really bad rap. And I want to make sure that to remind everyone, Brent, you did a really great job describing community learning in your, I think in the, the flyer of, it's a really umbrella term. And community learning is something that has uh, some really powerful objectives. And I, where it's failed is actually the implementation. Because if you think of all the different versions of community learning that exist, they're all really around centering community. They're about being responsive to community needs and really being engaging directly with communities. Those are all really amazing objectives. Where they've failed is really about the implementation. And that's where I wanna share my story because the reason I think Patrick is giving me way too much credit is our model is based upon the disaster that was my first work in community learning. 
Um, and so I, I hope everyone's familiar with a really amazing organization called the Lawndale Christian Legal Center um, on the west side. Uh, uh, and I know Tanya, you work with them very closely and Cliff Nellis, the uh, founder and executive director of that organization. So I got my start in Chicago in North Lawndale working what, with, with what was the predecessor to the Lawndale uh, Christian Legal Center. I was a community organizer before law school. I went to law school with this idea of I'm going to combine the, all the, the tools of being a community organizer with being a lawyer. So I quickly knew I was going to be a community lawyer. So I came to Chicago to be in North Lawndale and the West Side to be a community lawyer. For two years, I thought I was doing amazing community lawyering work. I was responsive. I did whatever case came through the door, uh, with, uh, but as long as my organization that was hosting my project, which was then called the Legal Assistance Foundation, as uh, anything that they could handle, I would take. I, would, I was in the community. Uh, so uh, clients would come to see me, um, would come see me in their spaces. I would go to them. They would never have to come to uh, 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 what was then LAF. So at the end of my, um, actually about 18 months into the two years that I was there, I was called in to speak with the Lawndale uh, Christian Community Church, uh, who was my community partner in, in, in working with, uh, on this project. And they um, basically told me that they really appreciated the work that I was doing um, and um, that uh, they really saw the, the impact that legal work could have on the community. Um, and they thanked me for my time and introduced me to Cliff, uh, who is going to be taking over and starting a program that the church was creating. I, I will admit that in that moment, it wasn't the highlight of my career to be basically told, thank you, goodbye, we don't need you anymore. But that's really, that was, that's for me, the starting point of the model that we now, we call community activism learning, because uh, we combine uh, sort of tenets of community learning and then also movement learning. So if you're not familiar with movement learning, I would really encourage you to look into movement learning. But for us, it really is an issue of power. Like the, what we often as lawyers forget about is how much power we have and we are not doing a good enough job of sharing that power. And, that is, and that's why I tell the story. For two years, I thought I was really listening to our community. So for those of you who are not familiar, the Lawndale Christian Legal Center, the only area of work that they do is juvenile justice. It was, the one, it was an area that I could not do at all because I was restricted by my organization. So even though I thought I was being completely responsive, I never recognized, I never listened, I failed to listen, I failed to engage to understand that, the, that I actually wasn't meeting their priority at all. The area that they felt when they could decide was most important, I wasn't doing it all. And, and it also made the question like, the church wanted something that belonged to the community. My, or, my, or the organization I was working for, it did, the program was ultimately theirs. They could end it, they could make the decision whenever they want. So as much as I thought I was listening, as much as I thought I was deferring and being led by, it was, there was no ownership. There was no, there gen, was no genuine decision making, and I completely failed to to engage in a way that facilitated them telling me, "Hey, Lom, thanks for your, the, doing great work, but you're actually not doing the one area that was most important to us." And so that's where that model for us about community activism lawyering came into existence, based upon the understanding that lawyers are really we can sometimes be so tunnel visioned and, and we really are not engaging in a way that facilitates decision making. And so for our model, how much can we depower lawyers and shift that power directly into the hands of the community is for, the, for us, our version of community learning. Um, so I wanted to share that story to make sure that yeah. it's like, it's through failure. <laughs> That we got to where we are, and we're continue, and we are, we are. I'm sure we're still failing. Well, and I was about to say that, right? It's like, and we continue to, but we also along the way have continued successes, right? And I, I need to jump in just so quickly because what Lam is saying about where we don't, where we're not successful always, 
as lawyers is an opportunity for other parts of our profession to be elevated. And I think what uh, I will take this as an opportunity to connect a dot uh, to community navigation or community advocacy or whatever you call it. Um, in other um, systems, not in the United States, it might be called um, community-based paralegals. It might be called any number of things that look like people who have skill sets without necessarily a JD, but they are the individual and the model that's elevated above the attorney in the sense that the attorneys come in when we need to, but the real work that's getting done on the ground with people and for people and by people is done by either, we call it a community navigator, a community advocate, a community-based paralegal, or something akin to that, uh, such that they are the folks that are actually changing what life looks like, uh, boots on the ground, right? What, what daily interaction with systems looks like for people. So that it's not a, um, early on in the West Side Justice Center, we hear this word a lot, empower people. And one of my teammates, uh, a, a storied and, and beloved activist and formerly incarcerated person, Monica Cosby, said, um, we can't use that word. And I was like, well, you know, everybody gets what empowered means. And she was just like, no, we can't use that word. She said, because empowered continues to uh, proliferate this idea that we have something that other people don't. It continues to perpetuate an idea and a model of lack. And we've got to not be a part of the model that continues to tell people in their communities that they lack something, that they're deficient in some way, because our legal system should be open to everyone. It should be accessible to everyone. Everyone should be able to find a case and read a decision and navigate a courtroom. These should not be shrouded in mystery and mythology. It should be open to people. It's for the people, we the people, by the people. So she offered us a phrase that we use often and frequently, which is repowering communities. And I took it a step further and imagine graphically um, a grid, a motherboard, if you will, and literally changing the circuitry on that motherboard such that communities that were once in the dark and, and had a power source, but maybe they weren't connected to the grid, that we repower by re, you know, um, circuiting that board such that those communities can now be illuminated. So think of you know, plugging in a lamp. The power is already behind the wall. It's already coming to your house from Comet, right? So you just got to figure out what's the right appliance, make sure it's not short-circuited, short make sure it's in working order so that when you plug that lamp in, the light comes on, right? The power doesn't exist in the lamp. It's behind the wall, right? You just got to activate it. And so I think LAM takes us to a point of where we're finally able because of technology because of being able to recognize that the world is actually flat and we're more connected than we than we realized um, and that we actually have a new generation of individuals who are able to turn some of these paradigms upside down on their head and God and because of our failures as Lam pointed out um, that we are able to create new opportunities in this space and so, Brent if I could just jump in real quick just to, just to add one profession onto the, the list of professions that, that Tanya articulated as the disruptors, um, I would add the, the word, the phrase social work. Um, now, I, I'm not saying all of you should drop out of law school and become social workers, though, I, in looking back, I actually really wish I had a social work degree. I, I, I get to work each and every day with social workers. Um, and our social workers are those disruptors, are those community navigators uh, that Tanya referenced. And it is an incredibly powerful profession that we as lawyers, um, particularly legal aid attorneys, have made um, a second class profession. Uh, it's so often you go into a legal aid organization, and there are 100 attorneys and one social worker. And that one social worker works harder than the 100 attorneys combined. Uh, and they're also, and I can use foul language, right? They're also shit on constantly. Um, and when I took over at the Brand Center, I, I looked at our social work team and I said, you have to be, you know, 
with us, you know, if, if not even elevated above our profession in decision making. Um, and, and so, and I think we've accomplished that at the Moran Center. So that I will talk, I mean, I, I talk about my faults a lot because I am Roman Catholic, but I will talk about one success that I do think we as an organization have elevated the role of social, work, social workers within our organization. And just thinking back to something that Tanya said too, that the structures are so, oh God, they're so broken. I mean, you look at the Illinois Rules of Professional Conduct. It says that social workers are just agents of, of the lawyer and they're, you know, they have to follow our directives and they have to, bleh. I mean, it's just horrible. Um, but at the Marine Center, we've said, no, 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 no. Like, okay, I guess if the Illinois Supreme Court was to drop, drop in on the Marine Center, we'd say, sure, we're complying with that. But it's more so about being in constant, communication, collaboration with those disruptors, whether they're paralegals or community navigators or social workers, um, that, that they're driving the, the bus as, as much as possible and that they're with us in that decision. So I just wanted to- I, th I think that's great. And, and that we are transforming each other's professions, right? Yes. Because Amen. there's a lot of pushback and, and I'm gonna be careful here, but there's a lot of pushback in some communities, especially in black communities about social work, right? because there, it is fraught with you know, models of oppression, right? It puts things in a DSM-3 uh, SR you know, context and says, everything that you're going through is an illness. Everything that you're going through is a pathology. You are sick, right? Versus systems being sick and needing to be dismantled and disrupted. So sometimes there's a conscious choice to you know, kind of put social worker you know, and social work stuff in the right context so that we don't cause further harm and further trauma on the people that we're trying to help. And I think that's where we have a positive opportunity to impact one another's professions. So we at the West Side Justice Center are often asked, don't you have social workers on staff? And as of this day, August the 5th, 2020, we don't on purpose um, because we are trying to blur the lines, if you will, between the lawyer and the advocate and the navigator and the social worker. Not that you each don't have your own level of expertise. And I went to school for three years to get my JD and somebody went for two years or three to get their MSW, but that we begin to recognize that we cannot operate in silos. Why? Because if we're delivering holistic services to people who are whole human beings, then we, can't, we gotta stop treating them as if they are compartmentalized. And we have to start to be able to speak each other's language in a way that the client on the other side feels as though that they are being respected as a whole human being and that they don't just have a rash or an eye twitch or, you know, some other small malady that somehow is their fault, but that they realize that there is an entire profession that's coming to bear with all of its resources intact and together working towards their betterment and their higher good. And I think that's a huge you know, shift that we still have some work to do in that area. Um, and is maybe some of the folks on, on the call here on the Zoom remember writing your personal statement uh, or somebody asking you, well, if you want to help people, why do you want to be a lawyer? Um, and you've got to push back and say, I'm going to do both. Uh, excuse me. I'm going to be a lawyer and I'm going to help people. I am both going to treat the social issues, uh, recognizing that we cannot continue to, uh, you know, keep them, you know, unconnected or disconnected, but all of these systems work together and I get to be a lawyer and uh, impact people's other problems because they all work together. And so I hope that you guys all wrote that in your personal statement. <laughs> So I also want to say this is the time where I would usually open it up for questions from... I'm so sorry, um, we talked so long. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. But I, I want to say I didn't really get that many questions. So um, for folks who are on who, who want to get, I want you to get involved in the conversation. So please chat me if you have questions um, and I can turn it over to you to ask or, or ask um, our panelists. But um, before I go to those, I wanted to we've been talking about community lawyering a little bit in not theoretical terms, but, but more um, less on the ground. And I kind of want to bring it to the, how this looks in practice. Um, so if you each could kind of talk about reasons why people fail to get the legal help they need, can, you know, the barriers that, that they um, bump up against on accessing services. And then some examples of how community lawyering helps overcome those barriers. Um, 
Lamb, do you want to start us off? Lam, sorry, I keep doing that. Yeah, actually, it's both Lam and Lam, so either one is fine. Um, so I, I think, you know, I can start by really talking about um, some really basic logistics, which is, you know, when in the legal aid organizations that I had worked at, so I think about seven years before I, uh, uh, before I, I started uh, uh, Beyond Legal Aid in 2013, 2014, um, lawyers are, for the most part, downtown. They are work nine to five, um, and you come in and you talk about what's going on. Uh, you quote ask for help, um, and you get quote unquote get help if you meet the priorities of the organization. You meet the income requirements, uh, and there are no restrictions uh, on the funding that is used to pay for the lawyers working at that agency, um, and that's really a problem because for a lot of the people that we work with getting downtown is uh, is a challenge getting downtown nine to five is a really big challenge and then i'm sh and i'm sure patrick and tanya uh, can really speak to the, their experiences with this but i mean the number of people who've gone from basically a bump from one legal aid organization to another they'll go and say let me let me share with you all the trauma that i'm dealing with to be told, oh, well, I'm, I'm sorry, we actually don't do that type of case here. Or you don't live in the neighborhoods, the zip codes that we work at. Um, so thanks for traveling two hours out of a day at time that, from your job. Uh, but uh, here's, a, here's a referral to another organization. And so that's what we're, what we're seeing in this is the, the way that legal aid is structured is all around how many hurdles you, can you overcome on top of what you're experiencing to get legal assistance? And it's, and it's assistance. It's this idea of you need help in order to somehow be saved. Um, so for us, the, we work generally uh, at the very odd hours. So evenings and weekends are really common um, working hours for us because that's when a lot of the, our community partners say, you know, this is when we, this is when, uh, we need our community members to be able to see you. Um, and then and the decisions as to what who's eligible for services, uh, again, that's something that are, are decided by our community partners and based upon what they, what they in their relationship with uh, community members are able to identify. So, you know, we have one or one um, of our programs, which is, um, I think it's a, 185% of the federal poverty level, um, and it does specify zip codes because they do want to. They do want to be. This is our community's legal clinic. Um, to another program which has uh, it's 300% of the federal poverty level, and it's um, anyone who is a, a current or former sex worker, uh, someone who is um, gender non-conforming, or someone who has experienced. Um, either homelessness or um, uh, transient housing over the last year. And because that's what the, their uh, sex work community uh, really identifies as what's being important. Um, so on a really basic level, it's, you know, that those, le those granular details that really have an impact on whether or not someone can access speaking to a lawyer. And then the second part is really around the, the issue of the not it not being assistance and not being help or some sort of savior complex that lawyers have. And that's really where we, you know, the, the legal work that we do and to try to keep it on a very uh, granular level, um, we actually let our community partners and uh, make the decisions also around the litigation. And this I have to say is actually the most difficult part of our work. Um, I think it's easy to say, um, it's fine. We can work at the hours that you set out. We can take the cases, but you know, as soon as you, as soon as you have a lawyer who's drafted a complaint or a motion, and the, I, and our, especially our new lawyers, when I say, okay, that's great, thank you, um, can you now send it to a non-lawyer to review to make sure that this is actually something that, that fits into their activism or organizing agenda, um, and and then for them to decide whether or not actually you they they even want to file this claim. That's been some of the most challenging part for our attorneys, particularly ones who come from legal aid. So, and actually, you know, to be fair, I had this difficulty once when I was working on a, on a housing case and I sent uh, my recommendations and proposed um, uh, a response to a settlement offer 
um, to our the tenant union. So uh, a union of tenants who are organizing collectively to fight against a developer. And they basically told me, thanks, but we don't like any of this. We want to do it this way. And I was, and I have to say in that moment, I was like slightly shocked that they were completely opposed. What I thought was an amazing settlement. Like I, I, I knew if we went to trial, there was no way we could get that. But you know, under our model, I completely deferred to the non-lawyers to say, our organizing strategy is this, what you've recommended, what you've wrote, what you've written does not make sense. We need you to do this. So I did it. Lo and behold, three weeks later, based upon their other work, so not the legal work, all their organizing and activism, um, they did this phone campaign where basically they got uh, people to just bombard the developer with uh, nasty phone calls. They completely capitulated. So they actually got like three times more money uh, and also legal rights that, that was not actually available at all under the under the uh, sort of uh, uh, the case, the legal case that we I was working on their behalf. So that that granular level is is just so critical that how do we do our work in a way that really incorporates our, the people we're working with and we call them community members. We don't have clients because clients create this hierarchy of power. And so how do we have community members be fully collaborative and fully engaged as equal or ec and equitable partners in working on cases um, is something that I think is really critical as well. Great. So we had a question come in. Angela, do you want to turn on your camera and, and ask the question? Great. Oh, you're muted. Hi. Um, so my question is, I work at an organization that's funded through LSC, and so the Legal Services Corporation, and so there's certain limitations and rules that we have. And so like with your story earlier about that they really want juvenile justice, well, that's not something that I can provide. So I'm wondering how can I let the community really lead the way and yet follow the limitations that I have from the funders? Initial thoughts. Yeah. So I can actually respond to this because I actually have spoken with um, uh, John Gallo, the new executive director of uh, the of what is now Legal Aid Chicago. Um, and so, on a very administrative level, from uh, from an ED perspective, he's actually considering creating a separate organization so that uh, so that the LSC funding goes to one goes to what is now Legal Aid Chicago, and potentially having a second organization that is separate and therefore is not restricted by the Legal Services Corporation funding. So that's one uh, possibility. And the other, er the other one I think is also just an issue of transparency and, and, and collaboration. And I think, I, don't, I think that, you know, I think two things. If you, if you are a legal uh, LSE funded organization, then you need to have these conversations. You need to be honest and transparent because I'm pretty sure that most of the LSE fund funded organizations are really committed uh, or, 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 or would, would be committed to community lawyering, but are they willing to be vulnerable in order to be, to fulfill their commitment? Are they telling the partners that they work with, hey, um, here, I need to put on the table that there are, I think it's 40, I think it's 43 or 45 different types of cases or, or people that I can't work with because of the restrictions I'm receiving in this funding. Um, and then from there, decide, you know, is it a good fit? Can I, can I still meet what the community needs? And is the community understanding and willing to work around that? And then the second part is, you know, sometimes, sometimes being, um, recognizing that you're not the one to do, to do this work is also really critical. So I would say, I don't think LSE Corp and, uh, legal aid organizations cannot do community. I absolutely think they can do it. There are occasions where I think they may, may not be the best fit and say, you know, maybe this grant I shouldn't apply for and have someone else who can apply who could would be a better fit. And I think that that uh, vulnerability is really critical. But yeah, and then and then more creative strategies. And I think this is all what it's, what it's ultimately about is community learning is about, as I think Tanya mentioned, disrupting and, and re rewiring the circuits so you can think creatively on how to think uh, on think through these things. Um, and then Kayla also had a, a question. Um, I 
Hi, can you hear me? So I actually work at the same organization as Angela and was wondering a similar question, but I guess if you guys could each also broadly talk about like how your funders um, shape priorities. So do you also get funding from like other sources or do they come from the communities themselves? Um, and then how do you remain sustainable within your funding models? I'd be delighted to take this one. <laughs> um, that is a very good question that as uh, coming into our profession, that's not often asked. Um, and so I appreciate the fact that you're asking it now because often what can happen is you can get down a road and realize where your salary is coming from and you're not enthusiastic about it at all. Um, not unlike Lon's organization, the Westside Justice Center is relatively new to this landscape, even though the attorneys may not be. We were formed in 2016 as a not-for-profit in a very organic and non-traditional way, in that a bunch of attorneys who actually shared workspace um, in a large building began to notice that um, as they moved into their new uh, building at the corner of Harrison in California, people started to walk in and say, well, who are you? What do you do? And uh, what is this justice that is on the banner outside of the door that you have hanging here that at the time said Westside Justice Center and still does? Um, and so these lawyers, being who they were, had to answer that question with integrity and say, well, we actually charge for our services. Um, but as time kind of went on, they recognized very quickly that they could not in good conscience sit there and charge for services when there were so many people that needed the services for free. And so um, that was the, the inception of the West Side Justice Center. It was a bunch of do-gooder, um, lefty, um, criminal defense attorneys, former elected officials, and do-gooders. Um, as you can imagine, that's not sustainable financially. Um, and I started actually as a volunteer and uh, began to kind of ask those hard questions. Well, like, how are you going to support yourselves? How are we going to make this thing work? I appreciate that you know, we're doing this, but how does that happen, right? And so the board then said, well, you are welcome to join us as the executive director and figure out those questions. And so we literally built the plane while we were flying it, which I did not make that up. And I hope that you use that frequently and often. But I heard a similar saying um, kind of spin on that was like, we're not, um, you know, building the ship to, you know, from scratch, but we're also not trying to, you know, build a slave ship either. Um, that's, I'm, I'm using that word and I'm, I'm gonna bring that point all the way home is that we cannot build systems that further enslave us. We cannot then build systems that further oppress us as we seek out funding agencies who's gonna donate money and how are we gonna pay our staff, right? And so that does become a very difficult question to ask. And so in our very early years, um, which were not that long ago, um, literally a donor would make a donation and we would put it in the pot and kind of divide it up because we were trying to keep the lights on and we were trying to make sure that people could support their families. Um, it is not work that if you are a black man and an attorney and you, let's say, want to support your family and be the breadwinner in some way, um, are you going to be able to actually do that, right? Like, are you going to be able to afford a mortgage and, and a, a car note and insurance and all these other things on the kind of salaries that we often pay. So this is a very um, complex question that then means that the biggest um, awards come from our governments and our philosophies and our missions and our visions may not also always be in alignment with those government policies. Um, and so we have to ask ourselves, I wish I had like the Chicago Coalition for the Homeless, which gets no money from not one government uh, agency at all because they get to basically do what they want to do but that took time right and that took some decades of um, well-heeled and well-financed um, donors contributing to that pot and I just use this, them as an example so what we try to do at the West Side Justice Center and why I wanted to try to take this this question first because Lam's organization and Patrick's organization belong to this bigger network is um, just a couple of years ago, we asked the government and said, we need more money to do community-based legal services. Um, you don't have money that's earmarked to do this. Nobody thought of this, um, but we're thinking of it because we know that there are 
organizations like ours who want to do this work. Um, and we want it to go to um, organizations that are in the community, which mean they have addresses in the communities that they serve. They don't want to be relegated to, I only serve 60612, I only serve 60649. We want to do the work that we want to do for the people who we want to do it for because we know that there's a need. And so we happen to be at a timely moment where we had lawmakers and legislators who said, you know what, you're right, you should have money to do that. First year was a fluke. The second year was actually purposeful, right? And, and we began to see the results. And we know that uh, a, a grant for a year or two is not gonna solve all our problems, but this is where now we get to take our story to other people who may not see this as a systemic issue and may have only looked at this as a legal issue and begin to beat that ban in industry and say, you guys need to put some money in this pot as well. Beat the ban with private foundations, um, which we often do, and say, you need to put some skin in the game. But also people like are on this call, that when we're thinking about you know, um, tithing to our churches or donating to charitable organizations, we have to start to elevate this work also to that level. Um, we are at a moment now where large corporations are feeling um, some kind of way about racial injustice and are dumping money in big pots and, and, you know, we're just getting like, oh, we got a check today. That should not be the norm, however. The norm should be consistent giving, consistent contribution on a systemic level to this work. And that's work that still has yet to be done. Um, but it can be a complex issue when the systems that you're trying to disrupt are the ones that actually are, you know, putting the food on the table. But that doesn't mean that we don't hold them accountable. And it doesn't mean that we stop you know, pushing the envelope. So one of the things that we said through Illinois Access to Justice is, yeah, we want, we want you all to be able to count how many people we serve and how many cases we close. But guess what? We're going to tell our own stories of success in the way that we want to tell them. And if that means I only close two clemency cases, that does not mean that I'm unsuccessful. What it means is that I've impacted a family, I've impacted a community, because I have invested lawyers, paralegals, and the like into this one human being because they matter and because they are important. And that's the story that we need to start telling. And those are the metrics that we have to start redefining uh, so that we can get the much needed resources that we need over time. Very long answer to a very big question, but glad you asked it. No, cheers to all that. Um, with the, the few minutes that we have remaining, I just wanted um, if um, each of you could take this one last question pretty quickly, but for the law students and recent graduates who are here with us today, what um, do you see as something that, that they can do to help support your work or address these concerns um, to help make change? I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so I had the real privilege um, of, of meeting Congressman John Lewis um, before his passing. And I actually, really oddly got to spend two days with him. Um, and, and one of the things, I, I actually asked him that question. I said, what, what would you tell you know, lawyers of today to do? And his number one, uh, his, his top response was, don't get arrested. If you're a lawyer, don't get arrested. Go to the protests. We don't need you to get arrested. We need you to represent us when we, <laughs> when we get arrested. Um, so, uh, the lawyers at the Moran Center have been doing that a lot. We've been going to protests, but we make for damn sure that we do not get arrested. So we're there for our brothers and sisters who are really putting their bodies in, in the way of injustice in our community. So this is a time where we, we have to uh, get out there and protest and make our voices heard. But as lawyers, do not get arrested because they need you on the other side <laughs> to get them out. Um, so that's John Lewis's advice to us. So I'm just passing that along. Yeah, I don't know how either of us could live up to it, but Lam, do you wanna go next? Sure, uh, so I would say um, make sure that you're, make sure you have the experience of being vulnerable uh, with someone. Um, so a client or as we call a community member, uh, at some point in the next year, say, I don't know, you don't know something, ask for help when there's something on a case that you are struggling with. Um, and, and then also, um, all, maybe it's on the case or maybe you need help because you're going through something really rough uh, in your life and have coffee 
have lunch, have breakfast, have dinner, um, do something social with, um, with someone that you otherwise would consider a client so that you understand that they're, they're a client and on, only this completely absurd construct. They're also a, a partner in a problem solving a, and a human being in a relationship with you that you need to see them as an equal and not as someone that you're here, there to help only. Great. Tanya, what are your last words? Um, I love the don't get arrested thing, right? That's great. Um, just continue to be open and, and as a lifelong learner. And just when you think you figure it out, um, question what you think you already know. Um, I think that it's very easy for people who are on kind of this side of the camp, if you will, to get caught up in our own self-righteousness. Um, we'd like to believe because we are champions for justice that we figured it all out. We're always right um, because, you know, we are fighting for the, the little guy. But I think that's exactly the slippery slope that you want to try to avoid. So continue to question your beliefs, continue to question your opinions. Talk to people who don't think like you. Um, experience life um, from the perspective of people who have not walked your walk so that you do not fall into the trap of righteous indignation. Um, and just continue to be an open, uh, lifelong learner. Wonderful. Well, thank you three for this really wonderful discussion that I hope made a lot of um, the people in the audience think about what, you know, what their next steps are. Um, so it's hard to believe that this is the second to last of our educational seminars of the summer. Um, our last one will be next week on Tuesday, incorporating pro bono into your practice on August 11th. So hopefully you will join us for that as well. So thank you um, to you all three. Thank we, you, we Brett, say, for having us. Um, and good luck you know, to all of you. Thank you. Dozens of us clapping on mute, but thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, all right. Have a great Take day. Care. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.